slide, then I am going to go through the slides and have some discussion. Please do put your comments in the chat box. I do have it open there now. Um, and we can engage in some conversation for sure. I have a few opportunities for that throughout. And just looking at the numbers of people, I might just um, I might just have it more toward the end, just so that I do get through um, some of the, the tips or you'll all feel leave feeling like you didn't get what you came for. Um, so we're going to talk about hosting virtual events and keeping people engaged. Um, I do notice that next week, I think is about student or student, I apologize, participant engagement. Um, so we'll touch on it, but I think that that's something that you'll learn more of next week um, in the webinar that Amanda has organized for um, next week. So virtual events, I think that we've all become pretty accustomed to all kinds of virtual events since March. Um, I suspect that probably we have a lot of experience by now, at least as participants. So throughout this, um, I want you to think about what you like and what you don't like about virtual events. What have been your experiences? So what has gone well? And what did you as a participant feel frustrated with or not really enjoy so much because we're actually going to revisit this toward the end and if there's time I would really like for some of you to share some of those experiences because I think one of the most valuable part of learning is being a participant um, and then taking what you learned um, and and applying it when you're when you're hosting your own events then so it's something to think about one of the biggest keys is the planning um, I know for us um, as educators at the college, um, probably something I learned very early on in my, my education with distance education was that it takes about seven, seven, times, seven times longer to prepare for virtual learning than it does for face-to-face. -face. So when you're thinking about whatever event you're planning, um, do recognize that it will take time. Um, it will take longer to um, plan for a virtual event than it would be for a face-to-face. -face. It's pretty easy to email people and say, hey, let's meet in the park to do um, a group exercise um, on Sunday at eight o'clock and everybody knows where the park is and they show up. It's much different when you're meeting online as you guys well know. So planning ahead is really the key. Um, the kind of, uh, I guess, best practice or thing to think about is if you can, send out invitations two weeks ahead of time. So if you're planning an event two weeks from now, send out the invites now that, and encourage people to check it out to see if it's a platform where people can enter ahead of time, then um, that gives them a chance to see if they ha are able to uh, connect to that platform. Um, use a simple method for participants to sign up. So um, some people, um, that will differ depending on your audience and where you're where you're working from. For Dave and Alicia at the city, you guys might have hundreds of people signing up. So um, thinking about the quantity of people. Um, for those of you in smaller communities where maybe members don't have ready don't readily have um, internet access um, or uh, maybe don't have computers at home, thinking about how then you can make it accessible to people who maybe um, are limited in their computer skills. I know um, we started teaching at the beginning of this um, this academic year. Some of our students had very, very limited computer skills and knowledge. Um, and so that's been something that um, was a huge barrier to overcome just to be able to get into um, some of the online or distance education um, platforms that we have. So that's not to make the assumption that people in smaller communities have less computer literacy. That's not at all what I'm, I mean. I'm thinking about internet bandwidth isn't always great. Um, and I know that sometimes from my experience, some people don't necessarily rely on the internet as much as, um, as we do in bigger centers. So sending reminders one week ahead of time. Um, and then again, on the day of the webinar or the event that you're planning, um, making sure that you're sending the, the day of. I saw Amanda sent out the link yesterday, which is fine. Um, so the, the thought process is that people will often, if they have an, uh, a lot of emails in their inboxes, they could possibly lose the link somewhere under all the other emails. So making sure that we're sending it on the day of or just um, prior to 
can help people um, to be able to, they don't have to dig through their emails to find your, the link to your webinar. Um, another suggestion was having it midweek. So maybe not having it on a Monday and not on a Friday, um, because sometimes people are extend their weekend. Um, they either start their weekend early or they, um, or they take a Monday off as well. Um, if people are traveling, those are often the travel days. So thinking about Tuesdays, um, when I looked at some of the literature, they actually said Tuesdays have the best turnout. So Amanda, it's like you planned it that way. Um, having this on a Tuesday, um, they said that Tuesday was the best, the best attendance is on Tuesdays. So I guess everybody here will be planning their events for Tuesdays, um, but they say midweek. So uh, whatever works for your organization. So planning in a virtual event, make sure that the presentation and the events that you're, um, that you're uh, planning are structured um, and that you've done the work ahead of time in planning. So making sure that um, it's really, it's a lot harder to wing it when you're doing it by distance, I'll tell you that. Um, I've tried that a few times, it doesn't work well. <laughs> so that's my personal experience speaking. Um, make sure that even if you don't have it, completely planned that you have some notes or some basic timelines of what you think is going to happen and when um, because it can be very easy um, to um, to kind of get lost in that um, to maybe I know from my own experience sometimes I've planned for things to be very interactive and then the participants are very quiet and don't talk very much. It's like crickets when you ask a question. Um, so I made sure that I had to have lots of ex additional kind of speaking notes or materials planned for the, in the event that people don't participate to the extent that I had originally thought they might. Um, some people aren't comfortable speaking up um, in webinars or virtual events. And so that can create a lot of airspace or downtime um, if if that time isn't sort of uh, planned for. Allow enough time for each section of the event or discussion. So um, if you are planning it to be interactive, plan some additional time. Um, knowing our audience is really helpful as well. I know for us with planning classes at the beginning of the year, um, we weren't familiar with our students. Um, and as time goes on, where we're meeting with the same people every week, um, there's more discussion, people are more engaged, people feel more comfortable. And so I think it depends on what event you're planning. For some of you, Cam, you might have the same people coming back each time to your, like your running events. Um, whereas with the city, you might have, um, you might have a lot of newcomers. So it might be um, a little bit different. Um, in terms of um, who attends each time. Um, thinking about writing a little bit of a script. So have some words written down um, that you want to speak, Do you? but don't read from it. Um, there's nothing less engaging than someone, than someone who reads straight from a script and doesn't have any um, doesn't have any um, accent to the words that they're using. Um, how long, how quickly would everybody be asleep? Um, I think we've all been in lectures like that. I think back to university days, <laughs> think about people reading from a script or being monotone um, speakers. So making sure that there's notes simply in case you get stuck, um, then you have something to read from. Um, if using a PowerPoint, keeping the words to a minimum is really important. Um, I don't know about you, but I've been at a number of events where there are all kinds of words jammed on the screen and you're so busy squinting and trying to read it all that you're actually not hearing the speaker. So um, you notice with my PowerPoint, I have quite a few words, but I actually have it animated. So it comes up one line at a time. Um, so it's not somebody you guys hopefully aren't sitting there squinting and trying to read everything. Um, that it's um, coming up in a fairly um, manageable chunk of information at a time. This is probably probably wordier than a PowerPoint should be. Usually the rule of thumb is um, three to five words per line. 
and no more than four lines. And I've already broken that rule because I got one last line on this one. And it says practice beforehand. So depending on your comfort speaking uh, in public, doing some uh, sort of public speaking, um, you may want to practice a number of times with a number of different audiences um, prior to the event. Uh, for some, some of you who maybe do a lot of speaking um, in your jobs or in your lives, it may not be, um, it might feel more comfortable to you. So you may, um, you choose to your, I would suggest practice to your, uh, to your comfort, what works for you. Um, I know when I didn't, before I started teaching at the college, I was a poor public speaker. Uh, not to say that I'm brilliant now, but um, certainly it didn't come as easily and it took a lot of practice before, even before teaching a class, um, because I wanted to make sure that uh, that I got it right, I guess, and that um, it felt comfortable. So it's all about the details. I'm going to tell you guys right now. Um, I'm sure a few of you have already experienced this. Maybe all of you have. I could be totally talking to the uh, to people who have way more experience than I do in this uh, in this event. But details details are so important. Um, technology. We need to know what we're going to be using before we use it. So the technology we'll be using. Make sure you that you know it well. Uh, make sure that you. Um, host some pretend events before the actual big day. Make sure that maybe you're, I know before we started teaching using Microsoft Teams, we would actually go in our offices and invite our, our coworkers into the room. And we try, and we still do to this day, we still try different things out with each other before we try it with students. Um, because it's a really it's a really good way of knowing not only what you're seeing and what you're experiencing, but what your students are experiencing. So we'll get feedback from our coworkers, or um, we don't just like call up random people and ask them to participate. Um, but we do um, usually call up our coworkers and and try different things with them. So uh, make sure that um, you know how to use the platform. Um, doing that test run ahead of time is really really brilliant. Um, especially if you have coworkers and friends that are going to give you really honest feedback, that can be really helpful um, so that we can, because feedback really is a way that we improve, right? Um, I know we had, we have a distance pilot course going right now um, with uh, students in the communities and they're all across the, uh, the north in smaller communities. And so the first week of classes, rather than actually having a class where we were teaching, what we did was um, we held a time, we held a space and a time open for students to come and log in, test out their equipment. Um, they tested out their audio and their video. Um, they checked to make sure that their computer was compatible with the platform. And that way, and I, I actually listened in on it, you guys, there was over, there were 27 people It was a bit frantic at times when people were logging in trying to get um, to get a, become accustomed to it, but we could talk them through it on the phone. So that's um, always, and Amanda said she's always happy to test platforms with people. And you know what, you guys, I am too. Just um, fire off an email to me. We're all kind of in this weird time together. And I think that um, the more that we help each other, the more we'll learn from each other's experiences. Um, because none of us is really um, experts at this. I feel like um, for myself as an educator, I've gone from an expert to a novice this fall. I'm really um, just learning. I'm learning along with students. Um, and I think that we're probably all in very similar situations in terms of using new technology. Um, so that's this plan to meet with learners or the people that will be attending beforehand, if that's possible. Um, just like we did the test run ahead of time with our participants in the class. Um, if you're holding, say if you're planning to do weekly check-ins um, 
or Kristen, you're planning to do your regional meetings, maybe the first meeting is checking out the technology, everybody logging in, making sure that everybody has what they need in order to access it. I know for us it was planning, figuring out who had webcams and who needed help um, to access their webcams or their audio. Um, there's lots of details that we often don't think about. And just when you think you've planned it all, there's something new that <laughs> crops up. So um, more details, providing orientation to participants. So um, housekeeping items at the beginning of the uh, webinar, uh, maybe letting people know where the chat box is, how to find it, um, how to unmute or to mute their microphones. Um, asking people to mute their microphones, I, I feel like you guys all did it automatically. Um, but and so that tells me you guys have attended quite a few webinars during COVID. Um, but there are people who maybe haven't attended as many and just need to, that reminder as well. Um, sometimes people don't know how to mute their phones if they're participating from a phone. So helping them with um, just making them aware of that option and how to do it at the beginning um, is helpful. I know that um, for some of our platforms, like Teams, for instance, I've taken screenshots and sent out Word documents with screenshots of how to do specific things in the, um, in the platform. I've sent it out ahead of time so that nobody's, um, so they have a visual of what buttons they're supposed to click um, and what they should, um, they should be seeing on their screen when they're signing in, um, because sometimes that visual is more helpful than, than hearing it over the phone. So that's an option as well. So um, provide, or why do I say like what? I guess, well, I guess I just explained that, didn't I? I just answered that question. So housekeeping items, where the chat is, how to put up your hand, where to ask a question. Um, and I'm not marking Amanda on anything at all. However, she got an A plus because she did all of that at the beginning of this webinar. Um, when asking a question of participants, allow some silence uh how many people are really uncomfortable with silence i'd probably be raising my hand right now if i were um were in the audience um, sometimes silence makes us really uncomfortable and i always say it's like you can hear crickets when you ask a question if anybody is from my generation you might might think of ferris bueller and and the teacher asking anyone anyone and no one's answering the question um we have to i guess just a tip to maybe become comfortable with silence um because sometimes it takes people a little while whether it be to drum up enough courage to speak um or maybe they're having a hard time unmuting themselves in order to speak um or maybe they they're worried to jump in because we don't have the same visual cues from each other as we would if you and I were all sitting around a table. I could see from your face or your your nonverbal that you want to say something or that you're about to speak. We don't have those same cues um, in a webinar or a virtual environment, and so just being mindful that we're allowing a little bit of silence and some space for people who maybe um, are a little bit unsure. Um, they know they want to speak, but they're not sure when the time is just right. <laughs> and Aaron, thank you for adding that. Aaron said, sometimes our kids in the background are just too noisy. <laughs> and you're absolutely correct. So many people are working from home or participating from home. And remember that people in their environment, you can't control what's going on behind you. Um, my children are grown up, but I used to, I had a lot of times when I was in meetings this, um, this, this year when I was working from home, my dogs would start barking in the middle of a meeting and I wouldn't be able to unmute myself. So I might want to speak, but I couldn't say anything because my dogs were um, too noisy. That's right. And I think that speaks to something else as well. Um, I'm glad you brought that up, Erin. Um, sometimes people feel vulnerable when you can see into their environment. So I'll, you guys all had your cameras off today, but if you're hosting an event where you're expecting people to have their webcams on 
and um, people feel a little bit vulnerable because you're invading their personal space. I actually had a student give me that feedback in May, say uh, when I asked her what she thought of virtual learning, she said, Wanda, I felt vulnerable. All of my classmates, my teachers could see inside my room and she was in her bedroom because that was the room where she could participate, where it was quiet. She said, I don't wanna have my classmates in my bedroom. Um, so thinking about other people's people's environment when they're participating. And I always suggest um, making participation um, optional. Some people are listeners and it doesn't mean that they're any less engaged than if they're actively speaking. Um, we make a lot of assumptions about people who people who are right up in the front row, uh, virtually of course, um, adding to conversation. We always know those people are engaged, but but people who are quiet are also can be engaged as well. So that's right, Tasia. There are a backgrounds um, or options to mute the background. There are. Um, different backgrounds that people can put up. Sometimes people aren't aware of them though, and maybe that can be part of the, um, the orientation as well. If, uh, if someone's, if you're thinking about um, maybe providing a, an inclusive or safe space for everybody. Amanda said she teach, I will say I teach online dance play classes and have, and some love having their cameras on and others ha hate having them. <laughs> um, I'd probably be on the don't want my camera on on that situation, <laughs> but thanks. You're uh, that's right. Some people are comfortable with it and some people aren't. Um, connectivity. I think a few things we need to be mindful of is uh, bandwidth and also the financial burden of um, multiple webinars. Um, people, our internet is really expensive in the north. Um, and I think we need to be mindful that we're not eating up people's um, uh, internet quite so um, quite so much, which might end up being a little bit of a um, ironic because I'm doing that to you guys right now. But um, improving connectivity, um, using platforms that allow people to call in with a phone line. So there is great value in this rather than having, so you guys may be connected today with your audio from your computer, but there are some platforms and I think GoToMeeting allows as well an option for people to phone in. Um, for people in small communities or people with low bandwidth or um, trying to conserve some of their internet, um, if they can connect to the webinar with just the video portion and then call in, um, those platforms, the phone line actually bridges with the uh, with the a conference uh, system, and it can save some of their internet. It doesn't eat up their internet so quickly, and also um, they have better connectivity as well. We do that for our night course, um, and it it seems to work quite well. There isn't such a delay or a lag in the internet um, because it's uh, they have a better connection. Um, so people can use a computer for video or screen. Oh, I just said that, sorry. Um, also having participants turn off webcams like you guys did, um, that can help conserve some of the bandwidth or the connectivity can be better. Um, and I know in Microsoft Teams, I didn't check this one out and that's, I didn't even follow my own rule, you guys. I didn't check out this platform uh, properly beforehand, but I know in Microsoft Teams, if I was presenting this, um, this, uh, PowerPoint, I would have the option to also turn off my webcam. So um, the facilitator, sometimes if I can turn off my webcam and turn off the incoming video, then that creates a better connection as well. Um, so that's just some tips to sort of reducing the amount of internet, um, being mindful of our lower bandwidth here in the north. So what helps you stay interested during virtual sessions? Does anybody have any um, anything that actually that help you to remain interested? Anyone want to share an experience? Hi. One thing. So, oh. oh, do you want to go first? No, that's good. Okay. So I was in a, a webinar and. 
they had us um, turn off our cameras and then they asked us questions and if we if the answer resonated with us we would turn back on our cameras and then we would see all the other people so like pressing the buttons was engaging and um anytime you can like do something like actively that's really engaging the jigging program is just naturally by nature when you get people up and moving but for meetings it is a bit trickier but there are some tricks out there that was one that i found was really cool that's great thanks for sharing that For me, uh, uh, again, I'm turning my camera on when I'm going to talk, and I turn it off when I'm not going to talk. We try to only have a question or make a comment in a meeting to to maintain engagement. So, like that's for myself. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. Absolutely. It feels a little bit more organic too because you're making you feel like you're making eye contact. Dave, did you want to say something as well? Yeah, I have one. Uh, one thing we did for Canada Day was uh, si similar to this. It was like a Zoom kind of house concert, I guess. So different people yeah. would be performing, and then I had a designated designated person to feature somebody else's screen every so often. So there'd be somebody in Ger Germany with their family dancing along to the music, and so on and so forth. And even some of the performers really enjoyed it because they said, oh, well, that's my cousin in New York. Um, it was really cool. That is, that's amazing. Think I could get people from Germany to come to my class? Why not? <laughs> uh, Wanda, there's a bunch <laughs> of people that have commented in the chat. So some people were saying polls pictures and activity, jam boards, online brainstorming, word clouds. Absolutely. And I love all of those ideas. For sure, polls and anything interactive is really um, is really helpful for sure. Uh, my only tip about that is make sure again that you know how to use it and that you run through the instructions um, or make it fairly user-friendly for participants so it doesn't become um, frustrating. I love the pictures. I even think about pictures. Um, sometimes ahead of time, I would um, ask students to send in a picture. Um, I would send out a, an email actually prior to a session and say, please email me a picture from your community that shows caring or that demonstrates um, elders in your community or I would have them send in photos um, and then I would compile them and use them during my presentation even or to to use it during class to generate discussion so pictures is brilliant I totally agree um, polls I like the online brainstorming and word clouds are really great ideas as well see you guys know more than you think you do already and I suspect we've all come up with um, things that we really liked and we didn't like for sure and I'm not making this as interactive as I should I apologize you guys um, I should have had some polls or something fancy but I'm not familiar with polls in go to meeting and I wasn't going to um, to be brave enough to try it when I'm actually talking about what you should and shouldn't do because I didn't want to do something I shouldn't. Um, and I guess that's another tip, right? Making sure that when we're when we're going to conduct something that's really creative and fun to make sure that we've um, tested it out ahead of time as well. Um, just to make sure that it, it functions the way that we expect it to. Um, another thing is to always have a backup plan. Always have a backup plan in case you're plan A didn't work, have a plan B and a plan C. Um, I know for us, we keep a, a teleconference line um, available to the teacher and students should our internet go down or we have students um, whose internet um, isn't working, then they can teleconference into a class um, so that we're not losing people for um, things outside of their control as well. But we know that's a common thing in the North, right? We internet service sometimes is variable. So making sure that we're personable. Don't be afraid to show your personality a little bit. Uh, we don't, none of us wants to be talking heads. Um, making sure that we're, um, that we connect with our audience. I'm hoping I'm doing that today. You guys might have, you might think otherwise. Establish trust as well. Um, 
you know, that doesn't mean we have to be the experts on anything. And as I already told you guys, I'm not certainly not the expert on virtual learning yet. Um, I'm still learning as well. But um, also, though, um, making sure that we sound confident in the knowledge that we do have, um, but also willing to be human, being human with people. Um, don't read to people. Um, you guys probably had a look at these ahead of time. So um, I won't read off the slides either. Taking a breath and pausing. Um, thinking about the fact that we don't have to strict, stick to a really strict or rigid timeline. Um, we don't want to speed through the material um, because then it feels rushed. Entertain them. This is the point where um, I would stand on my head and sing at the same time. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so <laughs> be entertaining. Um, sometimes jokes. Um, some pe there is some mixed kind of reviews on whether how much humor to use. Um, sometimes um, we have to be really careful because we don't want to say anything that we think is funny that might be offensive to others. So I'm actually pretty careful um, with uh, humor. I often make fun of my husband a lot in webinars, but um, because then I think he's the only one who would be offended. But, um, give, give participants information that will be helpful. I have to tell you, um, in my, my course that I'm taking right now, um, our instructor told us we had a mandatory, um, we had a mandatory webinar and we had to attend um, as part of our marks for our, our program. You guys, he wanted to meet at 10 o'clock on a Saturday, 10 a.m. on a Saturday, and he had nothing structured to say. I just wanted to meet and find out if you have any questions so far. And there was no, it was crick. You want to hear crickets? That was when there was crickets. Everybody sat there and there was a lot of messaging back and forth between students saying, this is kind of ridiculous. Um, if we had questions, we would have asked him. And there wasn't anything really that we felt was helpful or useful. So making sure that we're responsive to participants and what they would find helpful, make sure there's, there's a purpose to it. Um, Using the tools provided by the webinar platform, this speaks to the whole pictures, activities, polls. Um, some of the platforms have some really great, um, great tools. You can even pull up a whiteboard and have people draw together. Um, so there's lots of different options um, where participants can be engaged as well. How long do you think a virtual event should last? So best practice is about an hour, hour and a half at most, um, that people, our attention, um, sometimes um, shorter is better um, to keep us engaged and making sure that if you're going to have an hour and a half that you're offering a five minute break there part way through, uh, maybe getting having people stand up and move around. We need to ask for feedback as well. We ask for feedback so that we can improve, right? We're continually learning. Um, we want to know what went well and what didn't. Um, that way we can revise the next virtual event and we can be responsive to our audience, um, especially if you have the same audience coming back for another event. You want to make sure that um, you want to make sure that we're responsive to their feedback. So if there's something they said they really didn't like, I often, even in the classroom, I will change that then um, if I'm getting feedback about um, something that students didn't really didn't appreciate or they didn't like um, or they felt wasn't conducive to learning. So it's just a, it's a way that we can help improve um, and sharing our tricks with our coworkers and our <laughs> contacts. Um, what's worked well for us and what hasn't is a really great way to learn from one another. So we just have five minutes left. I'm looking here at my clock and I wanted to hear from you um, what what you like and what you don't like about virtual um, virtual events. Do you have some 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 things that you think work really well and things that you really don't like about it? I can I can speak. Um, okay, thanks. At the beginning of the summer, we were doing our day camp staff training, and 
There was High Five and another one that we did online. And they both worked, but they were really hard to get the students in particular, because most of them are high school aged, um, just to get them engaged because there was not the instructor physically there to be there um, forcing them to do anything. Um, so yeah, just the lack of getting people engaged and moving is really difficult. Yeah. It, and it is it is harder. I, it takes a lot more it takes a lot more of our energy too to even look at a screen as opposed to talking to people for sure. I see Kim said that she misses the personal contact with people. Um, that is really difficult. Uh, I know we're feeling it here at the college as well. Cam, you have your your um, yeah. unmuted. Did you want to speak too? So my likes are uh, from my experience this year. Uh, I did. I couldn't believe how much it brought the community together to have those events that we put on through the multi sport club, and even in Rotary we were hosting um, cooking classes as well through through a go to meeting or Zoom whichever. So it was really cool. I really like that. How in a weird time we could all come together and people really gravitated to it. Some people hate it, and that's that's fair. Um, thing I don't like is when five minute breaks turn into 20 minute breaks and I respect the time and I'm waiting for it to start, but nobody ever, they're not there for like 20 minutes. Man, that drives me nuts. Um, yeah. And then uh, my one little piece of advice that I f personally do is I treat all meetings as if I have a live mic on the whole time, uh, even if I know my, I'm muted and I have my camera off because there are times where I haven't. So <laughs> that's the other thing. But, <laughs> Thanks for that tip. Yeah, that's really important, hey? Yeah. <laughs> I think we all saw the bloopers at the beginning of COVID where people actually went into a wash, went into the bathroom with their uh, their phone unmuted or, um, yeah, there were some not so great things that went on for sure. I love that you guys are using the chat. So dead silence when questions are asked. That's something that we, um, I, I call it like the dead bird of, of presenting it's like this dead bird's been dropped in your lap and you have to do something with it so that can be really uncomfortable as a facilitator when there's that silence um for sure because we feel like we want to fill it um there's lots of meetings on the, Kristen I agree all of the um screen time the meetings and events online are exhausting um I feel like we're spending a lot more time in front of the screen. And I think that's one of the, the keys of keeping them as, you know, um, fairly short, an hour, as opposed to going two or three or four hour uh, meetings, maybe doing things in a little bit more condensed form. Erin said, you love getting out and meeting people, but it's a great way to get more training in an easier way without travel, for sure. I actually have met a lot more people this way than I would have probably if I was teaching in the classroom. I feel like I get to meet all of you online. Um, and Kayla wanted to plug the NWT Rec Leaders Facebook group. If you haven't yet joined, connect with each other and share ideas. And Amanda said, Bright Spot nominations. Don't forget. That's always my favorite part of the Rec Conference. I'm going to I'm going to sign off for now then if there's nothing else that um that anyone wanted to add um and I'll hand it back over to Amanda. Amazing. Thank you so much Wanda for taking the time today to share with everyone some tips and tricks. Hopefully you all uh, learned some new things. I did get a sneak peek of the presentation for next week. Um so it will be with Jen and Jen from Word Play Consulting. Um, and I did uh, get a sneak peek at it and they have some interactive things that they are going to kind of do during our webinar. Um, but the focus of that webinar next week will really specifically be on when you're doing training, uh, programs, events in person and how to engage people. So some of those comments that people address here at the end when Wanda asks you asking a question and nobody's saying anything to your kind of silence. Some of that is actually going to be addressed at next week's webinar. So a great segue into that. Um, otherwise, if you have certain webinars or things that you'd like us to bring up, please let me know since I'm working on our webinar series. 
Um, I already gave you a little hint that I am working on a volunteer one for November. We also have bright spots. Um, in the new year, I'm also working on um, some webinars on how you get people to come to your event, so getting the attendance. Um, a little bit on more on presentation skills, and then also building your confidence as a recreation leader. So if you have questions or anything, please let me know, or if you have ideas for other webinars, let me know. And to answer Patty's question, the webinar is free next week. Uh, so the link was up there above if you would like to register. Otherwise, thank you so much to Wanda. We really appreciate it. Um, I will hang on the line here if people have questions. Otherwise, I wish you a terrific Tuesday. Thanks, everyone. Bye, friends. We'll keep popping around my screen. <laughs> Thank you.